My name's Richard Espley and I'm a plant molecular biologist working at Plant and Food Research in Auckland in New Zealand. And one of the things that we're very interested in is uh, apples. It's an important crop for the New Zealand industry. And one of the things we're always trying to do is look at ways of uh, breeding and introducing new varieties to the market. And one of the things I'm really interested in as far as apples and fruit is concerned is, is the color of the fruit. So, so what is this red color? It's, I mean, apart from being beautiful and, and maybe a buying signal to us in the supermarket, what does it actually do and wh where does it come from? Well, it's a plant pigment. It's uh, called anthocyanin. It's one of a huge group of, of, of secondary metabolites in plants, part of the flavonoids group. And um, this plant pigment is involved in a number of processes in the plants. And one of the things it does is it provides sort of protective qualities for the plants. It's like, if you like, a, in highlight conditions, when it's, it's really bright and sunny, it's like a, a sunscreen. It protects against the oxidative damage of, of high light. But of course, one of the main purposes of this pigment, this color on fruit and in flowers, is to attract animals. So for flowers, it's to attract pollinators, come and uh, pollinate the plants. And for fruit, it's to attract animals to come along, eat the fruit, and then become the agents, if you like, of, of seed dispersal. Even bears would have eaten these apples and, and done whatever it is that bears do, so helping to spread the apples throughout the region. The wild apples come from Central Asia, particularly Kazakhstan. And as, the, as the nearby trading routes expanded, traders and their animals would have helped to continue the spread of these apples. They would have started the domestication of apples, taking them west into Europe and east into Asia, where they became the origins of the apples we eat today. And it's also very beneficial to us, these anthocyanins act in a similar way to us, not hopefully being fed to bears, but they act as a, a protectant and uh, they have these powerful antioxidant qualities that also work uh, in our systems. And they've been shown in numerous studies to protect against heart disease and uh, the onset of cancer. One of the things that really sets you alight when, you, when you're interested in this sort of subject is the amount of uh, different apple types there are out there. And in Kazakhstan and Kazakhstan, so in Asia, uh, they, they, there are these huge apple forests, wild apples, chock full of different varieties of different colors, different flesh colors, different skin, skin colors. And um, one of the things I found really interesting was these uh, apples in this region. And here's one of them, and I'm going to cut it open. And you'll see it's actually not just red on the skin, but red all the way through. So as a breeding target, that would be a very interesting sort of proposition to produce an apple that has, if you like, these good qualities, uh, these uh, beneficial qualities to our diet all the way through. So this is chock full of these anthocyanins. So if these red fleshed apples are so good for you, being so full of anthocyanin, why don't we just eat those? Well, unfortunately, they taste pretty awful. So what we need to do is take the characteristics we're looking for in this apple, for example, the red flesh, and put it into an apple that already has all the right qualities for consumers and retailers and growers. And to do that, we've traditionally done it through breeding, and that's been very successful for thousands and thousands of years. But the trouble is, it's a very expensive and time-consuming process. It takes many, many years, possibly decades, and thousands of crosses to actually find an apple that combines the right qualities from here with the right qualities from here. However, there is a, a little bit of a trick you can use to reduce that time, and that's to find the gene responsible for the cross you want in, in this apple, and then track that gene in all the progeny from the crosses of the two different apples that you're involved with. By doing that, you can reduce the time and reduce the effort to producing new varieties. The only problem with this, uh, a few years ago when we started on this project, we didn't know what gene was responsible. So we had to go and look for that, and through a series of, sort of various genetic tests, we found a gene, a transcription factor, that we thought was responsible for uh, the color in apple, and up to that stage, no one had found that. And 
what we found was a transcription factor that appears to regulate the, the biosynthesis of these, uh, of these colors. So the transcription factor acts in effect like a, a switch. It regulates other genes. And in this case, this gene, which we call MDMIB10, regulates a subset of other genes that are involved in producing these plant pigments in the anthocyanin pathway. So that's good. So now we can go and talk to the people who do the breeding and the people who do the mapping of these things and say, here's a gene. If you trace this gene through the, the crosses and all the siblings, you know that those siblings are going to contain or have the likelihood of containing this gene in this red flesh. So we found the gene responsible for switching on, if you like, the other genes that make all this red flesh. In fact, these trees in their natural surroundings, for example, in, in Kazakhstan, they're, they're not only red fleshed and red skinned, but the whole tree is red. The leaves are red and the bark is red, even the roots are red. So clearly there's something going on here. Now we know that these varieties, these apple varieties, are 99.9% .9 similar at the genetic level. There's maybe just one uh, DNA base in a thousand that's different between varieties that exhibit white flesh like normal ones you eat or green skin like Granny Smith or this red fleshed one. So there's not that many changes, but although we had a target now for the breeding of a red fleshed apple, we know what genes responsible. One question that we really wanted to find out was how come one variety that's so genetically similar can have, for example, green leaves and white flesh in its fruit, and another uh, uh, a variety have red leaves and red flesh in its fruit. So we looked more closely at this transcription factor gene, MDMIB10. We knew it controls anthocyanin biosynthesis. When it's transcribed and made into protein, it binds and switches on all the genes that make anthocyanin. When we looked at the gene structure, we saw an area where its protein binds its own DNA. It switches itself on. We found in red-fleshed apples, this area is mutated, so it can bind six times as much protein. This means that the gene is driven harder, so it makes all those other anthocyanin genes work harder, and so you get more color. So it goes to show that a relatively small change, a relatively small replication, rearrangement in the DNA can be have such a fundamental effect on the whole plant. And now we can use all this information to look at how we breed more successfully, more effectively new apple varieties, and maybe extend that information to other species entirely.